All right, gather round, you tentacled terrors and multi-eyed monstrosities, Professor Zixnorp's voice boomed across the lecture hall, his remaining eye stalks swiveling wildly. Welcome to Xenobiology 101, why humans will probably kill us all, and yes, before you ask. I did lose three of my eye stalks in a human-related incident. No, I won't tell you how. Let's just say it involved a birthday party and something called a pinata. A nervous titter rippled through the assembled alien students. Some shifted uncomfortably in their seats, while others extended sensory organs in rapt attention. Now, settle your various appendages and pay attention. This might just save your exoskeletons one day the professor's tentacles danced across a holographic interface, bringing up an image of a bipedal creature. Behold, the human. Nature's practical joke on the galaxy. A Glorpian student in the front row raised a gelatinous pseudopod. Professor, they look so... Squishy. How dangerous can they be? Zick Snorp's laugh sounded like a garbage disposal choking on a fork. Oh, my dear blob of innocence, that's exactly what the Zorgax Empire thought. Now they're a cautionary tale, and a rather unpleasant smear across three sectors of space. The professor began pacing, his six legs creating a rhythmic clickety-clack on the floor. You see, humans are walking, talking paradoxes. They're fragile, yet resilient. Primitive, yet ingenious peaceful, yet terrifyingly violent. They're like those puzzles that the Enigma species give as gifts frustrating, seemingly illogical, and likely to drive you insane if you think about them too long. He pulled up another hologram, this one showing a human smiling. This class is what's known as a smile. It can mean anything from I'm happy to see you to I'm about to disembowel you with a spoon context is key, and misreading it can be. Let's just say, unfortunate. A Vrexian student chittered nervously. But, Professor, surely we can predict their behavior based on logical algorithms. Zick Snorp's eye stalks drooped in what could only be described as exasperated pity. Oh, you sweet summer lava. Logical algorithms? When it comes to humans, you might as well try to predict a quantum particle's position with a broken abacus. He brought up a series of images humans in various activities, from bungee jumping to eating extremely spicy food. Humans, you see, have this fascinating and terrifying trait called thrill-seeking they intentionally put themselves in danger. For fun. The class collectively gasped, a sound that ranged from high-pitched squeaks to low, rumbling growls. Oh yes, Six Snorp continued, his voice a mixture of awe and horror. They jump out of perfectly good aircraft. They dive into ocean depths that would crush most of us into atomic paste. They even ingest substances that cause them pain. Calling it cuisine, the Seas Tick Trade Federation once tried to torture a human by feeding him something called ghost peppers the human asked for seconds and then posted a review on something called Yelp. A mobiloid in the back, its crystalline structure glittering with confusion, chimed in. But Professor, if they're so reckless, how have they not gone extinct? Zix Snorp's laugh this time was more like a wheezing cough. An excellent question. The answer is both simple and maddening they're too stubborn to die. He pulled up a chart showing human medical advancements over time. Humans have this saying necessity is the mother of invention, but for them, near-death experiences are like, well, like a whole extended family of invention. They've turned near-extinction events into technological revolutions. The professor's tentacles gestured dramatically. Imagine, if you will, a species that looks at a fatal disease and thinks, Hashem, how can I weaponize this that's humans for you? They turned the deadliest plague in their history into a medical revolution that now allows them to regrow limbs and cure genetic disorders. A floaty fish student bobbed anxiously in its hover tank. But surely, Professor, we have technological superiority. Our civilizations have been spacefaring for millennia. Six Snorp's eye stalks narrowed. Ah, the old technological superiority argument. Let me tell you a little story about that. The hegemony of utmost wisdom once decided to enlighten humanity by gifting them a small lunar outpost. You know, as a sort of galactic welcome basket. Two of your Earth years later. Humans had reverse-engineered the technology, improved it, and were selling cheap knockoffs back to the hegemony at a 200% markup. The class erupted in a cacophony of shocked noises. Oh, it gets better, Zick Snorp continued, his voice dripping with sarcastic amusement. The hegemony tried to retaliate by unleashing a cyber attack on Earth's primitive networks. Know what happened? A group of human adolescents, 
hopped up on something called Mountain Dew and Doritos not only thwarted the attack, but also managed to rickroll the entire hegemony fleet. A confused murmur rippled through the class. Don't ask what rickroll means, Zixnorp added quickly. I've been sworn to secrecy under pain of having to watch it for eternity. The professor pulled up another hologram, this one showing various human weapons through history. Now, let's talk about something that really sets humans apart their capacity for violence. A collective shudder ran through the classroom. You see, most species in the galaxy evolved to either fight or flee. Humans. They decided, why not both, and then added make it exponentially worse for good measure. He pointed to a simple stick. This is how they started, then he moved to a thermonuclear warhead. And this is where they were just a few centuries into their technological advancement. Any questions on the middle stages? No? Good, because it's a nightmare of increasingly creative ways to cause pain and suffering. A gloopy student in the middle row raised a pseudopod. But Professor, if they're so violent, how have they not destroyed themselves? Zick Snorp's laugh was now bordering on manic. Oh, they've tried. Multiple times. But here's the kicker every time they bring themselves to the brink of annihilation, they somehow pull back and come out stronger. It's like watching a species play galactic scale chicken with itself. And winning. He brought up an image of the United Nations. They even created organizations dedicated to preventing their own self-destruction. Imagine that. A species so aware of its own violent tendencies that it has to create fail-safes against itself. The professor's tone suddenly became serious. But here's the real kicker, the thing that makes humans the most dangerous species in the known galaxy their ability to cooperate. A confused silence fell over the classroom. Oh yes, Ixnorp continued. You'd think a species with their penchant for violence would be constantly at war with itself. And you'd be right, to a point. But threaten humans as a whole, and suddenly they're one big, happy, terrifyingly effective family. He pulled up historical footage of various human conflicts, then contrasted it with images of global cooperation in the face of alien threats. See this? This is humanity fighting itself. Brutal, messy, but somewhat contained. Now look at this humanity when faced with an external threat. It's like watching a quarreling family suddenly unite to beat the snot out of a home invader. As a poised student crackled with nervous energy. But surely, Professor, we outnumber them? The galaxy is vast and Earth is but one planet. Six Norp's eye stalks drooped in what could only be described as galactic face palm. Numbers? You want to talk about numbers? Let me tell you about the time the Hive Collective of Sector 7 decided to invade Earth with their million-strong clone army. The class leaned in, various appendages and sensory organs twitching in anticipation. The Hive thought they had it all figured out. Superior numbers, advanced technology, the element of surprise. They even picked humanity's most populous city for their first strike, thinking it would cause maximum panic. Zixnort paused for dramatic effect. Know what happened? The humans treated it like a spectator sport. They were taking selfies with the invaders, for Zorp's sake. One human, armed with nothing but a baseball bat and a bad attitude, took out an entire platoon before his morning coffee. The class erupted in disbelieving chitters and gurgles. Oh, it gets better, Zix Norp continued, his voice a mix of awe and horror. By the end of the day, humans had not only repelled the invasion, but had also reverse-engineered the hive's cloning technology. A week later, they were selling grow-your-own clone kits as children's toys. He pulled up an image of a human child playing with what looked suspiciously like a miniature cloning vat. The Hive Collective, by the way, filed for galactic bankruptcy shortly after. Last I heard, they were reduced to running a chain of mediocre fast food restaurants in the Outer Rim. A brainiac student, its oversized cranium pulsating with thought, raised a spindly arm. But, Professor, surely there must be some way to neutralize the human threat, perhaps through diplomacy or cultural exchange. Six Norp's laugh this time was almost mournful. Diplomacy? Cultural exchange? Oh, my dear cerebral friend, that's exactly how they get you. The Eternal Empire of Xarxus VII tried that. They sent their finest diplomats, their most enlightened philosophers. Know what happened? The class held its collective breath. Two planetary rotations later, Half the Axarxian diplomats had eloped with humans, a quarter had started a reality TV show, and the rest were running a lucrative import-export business, specialising in something called avocado toast. 
he brought up an image of a Zarxian diplomat, tentacles entwined with a human, both wearing tacky Hawaiian shirts. The Eternal Emperor, the first might add, is now hosting a galactic cooking show. His spaghetti carbonara is to die for, apparently. A photosynthian student, its leafy appendages rustling with curiosity, raised a branch. Professor, you mentioned human cuisine earlier. Is it truly as dangerous as the legends say? Zick Snorp's eye stalks widened, and his colour shifted to a pale green. Ah, human food. Now that's a topic that deserves its own semester. Let me put it this way, humans are the only known species in the galaxy that will knowingly ingest poison for pleasure. The class collectively recoiled. Oh yes, the professor continued, his voice a mix of fascination and horror. They have this beverage called alcohol, it's essentially poison to their system. It impairs their cognitive functions, disrupts their motor skills, and can even cause long-term organ damage. And what do humans do? They build entire cultural rituals around consuming it. He pulled up an image of a human cocktail party. They gather in groups, deliberately poison themselves, and call it socializing its madness. A Gravitonian student, its dense form causing a slight dip in the classroom floor, rumbled a question. But Professor, surely such behaviour is limited to a small, risk-taking subset of their population. Zixnorp's laugh was bordering on hysterical now. Oh, you sweet, dense child. If only. This behaviour is so widespread that humans have invented countless varieties of this poison. They age it, ferment it, distill it, mix it with fruit juices and tiny umbrellas. They even have competitions to see who can create the best poison. He brought up a series of images showing various human alcoholic beverages. And it gets worse. Some humans build their entire identities around their ability to consume large quantities of this poison without immediately dying. They call them lightweights and heavyweights, as if it's some sort of achievement. The Gravitonian student sank a bit lower in its seat, causing nearby students to float slightly. But here's the real kicker Zix Norp continued, his voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. Humans use this poison as a social lubricant, a way to lower inhibitions and facilitate interactions. Half of their mating rituals involve this voluntary poisoning. It's like... like using a plasma grenade as a party sparkler. A telepathic twin student, its two heads in perfect sync, projected a thought. Professor, speaking of mating rituals, is it true that humans... reproduce for reasons other than procreation? The entire class fell silent, various appendages and sensory organs twitching in anticipation. Zix Norp's colour cycled through several shades before settling on a deep purple. Ah, yes, human reproduction. Or as they often call it, fun buckle up class, because this is where it gets really weird. He brought up a heavily censored diagram of human anatomy. Humans, you see, have turned one of the most fundamental biological imperatives into a recreational activity. They do it for pleasure, for emotional bonding, sometimes even out of boredom. The class erupted in a cacophony of shocked gasps, disgusted gurgles, and intrigued chirps. Oh, it gets better, Zix Norp continued, his voice a mix of fascination and disbelief. They've developed entire industries around this activity. They have special garments, toys, and even educational materials. They call it adult entertainment, though I assure you, most adults of other species would find it more terrifying than entertaining. A quantum fluctuation being, its form shimmering in and out of reality, managed to stabilize long enough to ask a question. But Professor, surely such. Unrestrained behavior must lead to rapid overpopulation. Zix Norp's laugh was now tinged with a hint of admiration. You'd think so, wouldn't you? But humans, in their infinite capacity to complicate everything, have developed numerous methods of contraception. They've effectively separated the act of mating from its biological purpose. He brought up an image of various human contraceptive devices, causing several students to avert their sensory organs in embarrassment. And here's the real mind-bender the professor continued, his voice dropping to a dramatic whisper. Some humans choose not to reproduce at all. They call it child-free, imagine that. A species so advanced, so contrary to basic biological imperatives, that they can simply opt out of reproduction. The quantum fluctuation being flickered rapidly, as if struggling to process this information. But Professor Hive Mind collective student buzzed, its thousand tiny components vibrating in unison. If humans are so chaotic, so unpredictable, 
How do they maintain any form of social order? Zick Snorp's eye stalks perked up. Ah, an excellent question. The answer is both simple and utterly baffling they make it up as they go along. He brought up a series of images showing various human legal systems, governments, and social structures. Humans have this thing called society, which is essentially a set of agreed-upon rules that everyone immediately tries to find loopholes in. They create complex systems of governance, only to spend most of their time arguing about how to change them. The hive mind collective buzzed in confusion, its components briefly losing synchronization. Take their concept of democracy, for instance, Zix Nort continued. They actually let the general population decide who should lead them. Can you imagine? It's like letting a Zorg beast choose your brain surgeon. He pulled up an image of a human election. They have these events called elections where potential leaders engage in a bizarre ritual of promises, insults, and something called kissing babies. The winner is often the one who can shout the loudest or look the best on something called television. The class chittered and gurgled in disbelief. But here's the real kicker, Zix Norp said his voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. Despite this seemingly chaotic system, humans have managed to create complex societies, build impressive civilizations, and even venture into space. It's like watching a flumberian juggling octopus successfully perform brain surgery while riding a unicycle. Here, crystalline entity student, its facets refracting light across the classroom, chimed in with a melodious tone. Professor, you mentioned humans venturing into space. Surely their fragile forms aren't suited for the harsh realities of interstellar travel. Zix Norp's laugh this time sounded like a malfunctioning warp drive. Oh, my sparkling friend, you've just stumbled upon one of the greatest paradoxes of human existence. Their bodies are indeed woefully unprepared for space travel. So what do they do? They decide to go anyway. He brought up images of early human space exploration. Look at this. They strapped themselves to giant tubes filled with explosive chemicals and hurled themselves into the void. Their first vessels were essentially tin cans held together by hope and something they called duct tape. The class collectively winced, various appendages and sensory organs recoiling in horror. But wait, it gets better, Zix Nort continued, his voice rising in pitch. When they realized their bodies couldn't handle the rigors of space, do you know what they did? They decided to change their bodies. He displayed images of human spacesuits and various bio-modifications. They've created artificial atmospheres, developed radiation shielding, and are even experimenting with genetic modifications to make themselves more space-worthy. It's like watching a fish decide it's had enough of water and start growing legs. A gaseous consciousness student, its form swirling in agitation, wafted a question. But Professor, surely such reckless behavior has led to numerous disasters. Six Norp's eye stalks drooped slightly. Ah, yes. Humans are no strangers to tragedy. They've lost brave explorers to the unforgiving vacuum of space, had ships disintegrate upon re-entry, and faced countless near misses. But here's the truly baffling part every disaster only seems to make them more determined. He brought up images of various human space memorials. They honor their fallen, learn from their mistakes, and then double down on their efforts. It's simultaneously admirable and terrifying. Imagine a species that looks at the deadly vacuum of space and thinks, challenge accepted. The gaseous consciousness student condensed slightly, as if trying to make itself smaller. But let's move on to something even more perplexing, Zix Norp said, his tone shifting to one of bemused wonder. Let's talk about human entertainment. He brought up a series of images showing various human leisure activities. Humans, you see, have turned the act of doing absolutely nothing productive into an art form. They call it relaxation or downtime and they consider it essential for their mental well-being. A perpetual motion entity student, its form a blur of constant movement, vibrated in confusion. Professor, are you saying humans voluntarily choose to be inactive? Zix Norp's laugh was a staccato of disbelief. Oh, it's so much more bizarre than that. They create elaborate fantasies, entire fictional worlds, for the sole purpose of temporary escapism. They call it entertainment. He displayed images of human movies, video games, and books. They spend countless hours immersed in made-up stories, pretending to be people who don't exist, solving problems that aren't real. And the truly mind-boggling part. They pay for the privilege. The perpetual motion entity's movements became so erratic it nearly phased through its desk. But it gets even stranger, Zixnor continued. 
his voice rising with excitement. Humans have competitions where they watch other humans play games. Not for survival, not for mating rights, but just for fun. They call it sports, and it's practically a religion for some of them. He brought up images of various human sporting events. Look at this. Thousands of humans gathered in one place, watching a small group of other humans chase a ball around. They cheer, they cry, they paint their bodies in garish colours. It's mass hysteria, sanctioned and celebrated. The class erupted in a mixture of fascinated chirps, bewildered gurgles and horrified shrieks. And don't even get me started on what they call reality TV Zykes nor padded. His eye stalks twitching spasmodically. It's neither real nor particularly televisual. But humans are obsessed with watching other humans do mundane things or engage in artificially created conflicts. It's like... Like voluntarily subjecting yourself to a mind flayer psychic probing, but for fun. A temporal anomaly student, its form flickering between past, present and future states, managed to stabilize long enough to ask a question. Professor, given all these bizarre and seemingly counterproductive behaviors, how have humans managed to survive, let alone thrive? Zixnorp's color shifted to a deep, thoughtful blue. Ah, now we come to the crux of the matter. The true paradox of humanity. You see, all these behaviors we've discussed, their recklessness, their adaptability, their bizarre social structures and entertainment, they're all part of what makes humans so formidable. He brought up a montage of human achievements, artistic masterpieces, technological marvels, acts of incredible heroism and kindness. Humans, in all their chaotic, unpredictable glory, have an unparalleled capacity for creativity, innovation and empathy. Their very illogic gives them an edge. While more rational species might see an insurmountable obstacle, humans see a challenge. Where we see limitations, they see possibilities. The class fell silent, various sensory organs and appendages focused intently on the professor. Their adaptability allows them to thrive in environments that would kill most species. Their social structures, as bizarre as they may seem, allow for an incredible diversity of thought and approach. And their entertainment? It's a never-ending exercise in imagination, constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Zix Norp's voice took on a tone of grudging admiration. In essence, the very things that make humans so perplexing, so frustrating to deal with, are the things that make them so dangerous. They're unpredictable, yes, but that unpredictability has led to some of the most astounding breakthroughs in galactic history. He brought up an image of Earth, a small blue marble floating in the vastness of space. This class is why humans will probably kill us all. Not necessarily through violence, though they're certainly capable of that. But through their relentless drive to explore, to expand, to understand, they'll remake the galaxy in their image, not because they set out to conquer, but because they simply can't help themselves. The temporal anomaly student flickered rapidly, as if trying to process multiple futures at once. So remember, Class 6 Nort concluded, his tone both warning and wistful, when dealing with humans, expect the unexpected. Prepare for the impossible. And for the love of all that's holy in this galaxy, never, ever accept their offer of just one more drink. The bell rang, a cacophony of alien sounds signalling the end of the class. For your homework, please read chapters 5 through 7 Human Mating Rituals, A Survival Guide Why Earth Foods Will Probably Kill You in Sports, or how humans turn everything into a competition class dismissed. And remember if you see a human smiling at you, run. It's safer that way. As the students filed out, a mixture of terrified and fascinated, Professor Zix Norp slumped into his chair. He pulled out a small, earth-made device from a hidden pocket, smiled fondly at the picture it displayed, and muttered to himself, humans, can't live with M, can't live without M. Galaxy help us all. He glanced at his schedule for the next day, Xenobiology 102, why you should never, ever play poker with a human Zixnorp side, a sound like a deflating accordion. Tomorrow was going to be another long day.